So here we are yet again, opening a fresh new lecture on deep fusion. And uh, this lecture is lecture 16 out of the eighth week. And we're going to discuss uh, Brownian motion. What is Brownian motion? How does it relate to diffusion? Uh, the uh, fixed experiment, just briefly so you'd understand what is going on. And we're going to dive into the first law of diffusion, which we would need for the labs. It's also in the minimals. It is also quietly, quite often asked about. And what is the diffusion constant? Also in the minimals, also for the labs, and also is asked about. Essentially, this part is a great deal out of the diffusion uh, diffusion um, topic. So let's get started. Brownian motion is basically a way of saying that <coughs> particles, let's just say, I have gas particles in a container. These particles, this is my container, I'm going to close it up, very good. These particles have some sort of energy to them that arises from temperature. And that causes them to bounce around in every direction in a random manner. And as they collide with one another, they're going to exchange momentum and energy. They're going to collide and exchange momentum and energy. And you can, you can just imagine a container full of gas doing just that. And in this case, you can say that it's a total random walk. Random walk. And that would, that would imply that any particle can move in any direction, really. And in any direction, you can have another particle that it can impart some of its momentum. Maybe it'll lose some, and maybe this will go over here, and that will go over there. And this is going to cause a total, a total random walk of all the different particles. And this really relates to diffusion. And we're going to talk about diffusion in a second. A lot of people say Brownian motion really is diffusion. And a lot of people say that diffusion is propelled by Brownian motion. I wouldn't say any of these is a mistake, but I would say that Brownian motion is tightly related to diffusion. And as far as diffusion, we can discuss Adolf's Fix experiment. And often you would hear about it as Fix experiment or Fix laws of diffusion, because Adolf is kind of a name that lost its shine after the, after the late 30s and early 40s. So you don't really see Adolf anymore under Fix experiment but that was his name. <clears throat> what he did is that he was able to insert uh, a dye, and this is the dye, insert a color dye under a layer of water in a way that they would not mix, in a way that they would just be, just be seated one on top of the other, and he just waited. And after a while, he noticed, after a while, he noticed that these two uh, co-mingle until they get to a point in which they're entirely homogeneous, until, until they get to the point in which they're entirely homogeneous. And this is all, all nice, really, because Adolf Fick was the first one to quantitatively uh, explain this relationship. And basically, when we're talking about diffusion, and you can just look, look up different, uh, different definitions, either online or in the presentation, but basically, the, the basic way of saying it is the net transport and it's important to have a net transport because, uh, because if, let's just say, I have a container and a particle is moving from here to here and another particle is moving from here to here, I don't have any net transport because there's no net flux. One is canceling the other. A net transport would mean that there is a sum of particles moving from one side to the other. So it's the net transport of particles from the area of higher, higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. And if for some reason you expect an open essay question and you want to define diffusion, as long as you have these, these three elements, these three key phrases, you should be good with explaining diffusion. And you can also say that diffusion is propelled, propelled by Brownian motion, propelled by Brownian motion. And later on, we'll quantitatively explain, and I'll also try to explain the intuition behind what affects diffusion. But before we do, we're going to talk about the first law of uh, diffusion, fixed first law. And instead of, of just copy and pasting it, I would like to write it from scratch, because I find it easy to explain formulas 
instead of memorizing formulas. So I can say, by, by the way, instead of writing delta, which is change, in the minimals it's written, or in the presentation it's written as d, d means delta. So whenever I see delta m is really the change in matter. So I'm going to explain the rule as I'm writing it. It is the change in matter over the change in time in a certain diffusion constant or diffusion coefficient over a cross-section area in a concentration gradient. So it's basically the transport of matter over time, transport of matter over time, according to some sort of coefficient, just like we have absorbing coefficient, we have diffusion coefficient. So matter transported over time via coefficient through a cross-section in a gradient. Very good. And if you can understand the idea here, first of all, you can understand Fick's first law of diffusion. And also, you can explain what the coefficient is. What is the diffusion coefficient? And when I'm saying diffusion coefficient, coefficient and constant, it's the same thing. So if you hear those interchangeably, these do mean the same thing. The diffusion coefficient, the diffusion constant, same thing. And the diffusion constant, constant is the amount of matter transported, matter transported through a unit time, through a unit time, and a unit cross section, unit cross section per unit concentration or concentration gradient, you can say, concentration gradient. And this is really what's in the minimals. Basically, you're talking about the same thing as here because. What I'm saying is, it's the uh, transport of matter over time through a unit cross-section in a concentration gradient. So it's not that bad when you understand it. If you repeat it a few times, maybe if you write it a few times, then you'll understand it. And obviously because there is the first and second law of diffusion, and really for test purposes, you need to focus on the first, because the second law, if you look at the next uh, page of the presentation, the next slide, looks a little messy. And what I really want to say is what does the first law, um, when is the first law applicable versus the second law? So you have the first fixed first law and fixed first second law. And here what we're saying is the, the gradient does not change. The gradient does not change. And here, as you may expect, the gradient, gradient does change. And it is a more dynamic formula. There is more, there is more uh, quantitative relationship as far as dynamics. But really, we need to focus on this law, both for the labs and for the exams. And if you kind of have a hard time figuring out when does the concentration gradient not change, when, when particles are transported to where they are not as concentrated, well, I'm going to try and give you an example. And if you don't understand it, not very necessary, but let's just say I have a certain cell. This is my cell. I have a cell. This is its membrane. And I know that via diffusion, just because uh, we're all adults, we pretty much know that it takes in oxygen. It takes in oxygen. This is just basic knowledge. It takes in oxygen and puts out carbon dioxide. Pretty much, I'm not going to get into the processes of what's going on, but this, these two processes occur via diffusion. So what I'm saying is, in a given cell, I'm not going to have, at let's just say, uh, I'm looking at the cell at time point one, then I'm going to look at it after a couple of seconds, and then I'm going to look at it after, after two minutes, and then I'm going to look at it after a day. And in any given normalized condition, it's always going to have the same amount of oxygen and the same amount of carbon dioxide, because it's always going to have a certain amount of oxygen, usually around the same ranges and a certain, certain amount of carbon dioxide. Although, in effect, let's just say I have carbon dioxide as, as pink. Carbon dioxide is pink, and oxygen is going to be white. Although oxygen is constantly taken up by the cell, it's constantly taken up by the cell, also, carbon dioxide is constantly expelled by the cell. And the relative concentrations do not change dramatically, obviously not in certain cases, but if I look at certain time frames, maybe I will observe the same concentration. So even though 
there is a gradient and there is net transport across the membrane of the cell. The concentration may not change, the concentration gradient may not change drastically. So this is just an example. Hopefully you have a little bit of intuition and if you didn't really understand this, it's not a must, it's not necessary. Let's see you on the next video.